We shall proceed with our second one-on-one -on -one session, which is the future of learning. I am also myself very interested to find out what is the future of learning because uh, when I graduated from university many, many years ago, the computer wasn't really fun fully functional. You know, we only had these flow charts. We still use those large disk kits. It was expensive to buy a computer. But now, even in schools for, for children, all the way up from kindergarten, all the way to university, everyone just uses a computer. Everyone doesn't anymore know how to write or to express their ideas in a sheet of paper, just like the former prime minister of Sweden, Goran Persson. As you can see, he doesn't depend on his iPad or on his smartphone to write his ideas. It's all here in the head. So I really want to find out if teachers are eventually going to be obsolete. So what should be the purpose of schooling? And does technology hurt education? So we have with us a very important person who was just flown in from England to discuss this with all of us. He's a professor of educational technology, and he will be sifting us through the origins of schooling as we know it to the dematerialization of institutions as we know them. He has 13 years of experiments in children's education, and he will be taking us through a series of startling results. Children can self-organize their own learning. They can achieve educational objectives on their own, read by themselves, and finally, the most startling of them all, groups of children with access to the internet can learn anything by themselves, from the slums of India to the villages of India and Cambodia to the poor schools in Chile, Argentina, Uruguay, the U.S., and Italy to the schools of Gateshead and the rich international schools of Washington and Hong Kong. Let us all please welcome to Malaysia and to the World Innovation Forum, Kuala Lumpur 2013, Mr. Sugata Mitra. So before Professor Mitra will have his uh, presentation, we would like to maybe set the stage about, I mean your ideas about education. It, you, you told me earlier that you've been here in and out of Malaysia for the past 15 years. Tell us, tell our audience here in, in Malaysia, why do you always come back to Malaysia? Well, actually, there's something um, that many people don't know, which is that um, when I start my talk, um, you will hear about an old experiment which I did 13 years ago, which uh, is usually called by the media the mm -hmm. hole-in-the-wall experiments. And I did those in 1999, and... There was a lot of um, excitement in India. And then, for the first time when I spoke outside of India about the results of that experiment in 2000, it was in Kuala Lumpur. So the very first time that, that those results came out of India, and I still remember the audience um, at, of those days in Malaysia 13, 14 years ago, um, sitting there and, and saying, this is impossible. And now it's possible. <laughs> so since then, about every three or four years, I come back, and they first said, oh, no, it is possible. Then they said, it's very possible. <laughs> and then they said, it's lovely. <laughs> so this is a very interesting topic, uh, Professor, that you'll be talking about. Schools in the cloud. Yes. Schools in the cloud. So is this an indication, then, that teachers in institutions will now be obsolete? Well, not really. Um, they have to change. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying that teachers will become obsolete, but uh, they will change, much as um, uh, the first automobiles are, have no resemblance to the cars of today. So it's not that the car disappeared, but it changed. Mm -hmm. That's what I think will happen in education as well. And uh, what should be the purpose of, of schools be? Well, you know, that's been debated uh, for years about why do we send people, why do we send children to school? And of, of course, everybody, every parent has an answer, which is to say, well, you have to prepare him for life. Mm -hmm. um, but is, that that, is that the way forward? Because when my son goes to school and I ask him, 
when he comes home, what did you learn? He just tells me, I enjoyed my time in school, but he doesn't really tell me what he really learned. Well, that is increasingly a problem which I will again uh, mention as, uh, as I speak. And I'll uh, sort of uh, tell you what the problem is. The problem is that when you say prepare my child for life, an eight-year-old today will probably live to be a hundred. Mm -hmm. So for which world shall we prepare him? So what schools end up preparing children for is your world, mm -hmm. the parents' world. But that world is gone, will be gone in, in the will next Will be gone when he's already... So, so what shall we do? And I, uh, I don't have a complete answer to that, but I have a part of an answer. And at the end of this lecture, we'll see if the audience perhaps agrees and with that. And of course, technology already plays a big part technology in naturally education. Has to you know, my son from uh, kinder one all the way up, now he's grade three or primary three. He just basically uses his MacBook. Right. And I tell him, you should learn how to write. You should learn to be able to express your ideas through writing. But now I, when I get to see spendenship, I'm really truly disappointed because they are now so totally dependent on technology. Well, uh, your child, I'm afraid, is probably going to grow up never having to write anything by hand. Mm. <laughs> so, oh, no. <laughs> so, so in that <laughs> I word, love writing. So in that world, I like uh, handwriting as well. But I think handwriting will become a hobby. <laughs> <laughs> and now... Um, Professor Mitra, we would like to listen to your presentation, so please take it away. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, Sugata Mitra, Professor of Educational Technology. So, good afternoon, and as I said, I have this sentimental association with Kuala Lumpur. So, I was, when I stand here, I think back to, um, I think it was the January of year 2000. Um, Anyhow, I, uh, when looking at the future of uh, learning, um, I decided to give the title Schools in the Cloud uh, to this talk for a reason which I hope will become obvious as we go along. Um, to start with, I, I suppose you're all very familiar with this picture. You know what it is uh, a picture of. Um, now, if I were to say, when do you think this picture was taken? It could have been 30 years ago. It could have been 100 years ago. It could have been 200 years ago. And surprisingly enough, it could have even been 300 years ago. Nothing has changed in that structure. OK, the blackboard may have changed to something else. But this structure remains the classroom. So I, I started to think of where did it come from? Who actually built that structure? And you'd be surprised, it's very hard to find out. Because this uh, structure of primary education is uh, from prehistory, from a time before history was ever written down. Even then, there were classrooms. So then I started to reconstruct that situation just by doing a thought experiment. And I'll take you, with, uh, uh, I'll take you through that uh, to see if it makes sense. If primary education started in prehistory, which means around five or 6,000 years ago, then obviously at that time, reading and writing did not exist. So if you wanted to learn something, you had no option but to go to a person who knows that, bring him, and say, you tell me, orally, and I will listen. So that had to be the only method of that time. So now, obviously, uh, in order to listen, you need a quiet place. So the speaker will then say to the learner, sit down and listen carefully. Now, uh, as I'm talking, you have to think to education today, and you'll see that those things are leftovers from 5,000 years ago. Sit down and listen carefully. All right, then um, I looked for uh, at what volume do normal human beings speak. It's about 60 decibel. And uh, you can work out uh, up to what distance you can be heard if you are speaking at 60 decibels. And, of course, where you don't have microphones. 
it turns out to be about 6 meters, 18 feet. So then you say, I want a 18 feet by 18 feet room. If it's bigger than that, it won't work. Now, how many people can you put into a 6 meter by 6 meter room? If you calculate again, at one square meter roughly per person, leave some space for the speaker, you get a number, it's about 30. So now you have a 6 meter by 6 meter room with 30 learners inside it, one teacher speaking to an audience who will sit quietly and listen. So this structure that you look at, the classroom, is from 5,000 years ago. We still use that design. Everything else has changed, but it hasn't changed. So now then what happens next? What happens next is that paper becomes easily available. You can imagine that when paper first came into the classroom thousands of years ago, uh, it must have been treated as brand new technology, paper and writing. So when writing comes into existence, then what does the teacher say? The teacher then says, okay, sit quietly and write down what I'm saying. All right, take notes. Now he no longer says, listen to me and memorize it, but he says, write down notes and read it later. The examination changes from being a voice-based examination where you're asked a question and you have to answer it to one where the question is written down somewhere and you have to write down the answer. In an earlier age, when it was oral, it was necessary that you should be trained as a child to speak clearly and properly. That's what the primary teacher of 5,000 years ago must have said. Listen, in the examination hall, speak very, very clearly, otherwise you will fail. When paper comes in, the teacher changes her tactics. The teacher now says, well, never mind how you speak. Nobody is going to ask you anything. You, your handwriting must be very good. Because if the examiner cannot read your handwriting, you'll fail. So the technology changes the pedagogy. Then, about 1,000 years ago, I think, no, less than that, much less than that, uh, the printing press gets invented. So now you have books. And when you have books, now the learner says to the teacher, why do I want you? I don't need you to talk to me. I, I'll just read your book. So now the teacher says, well, we are in trouble now. What do we do? The learners will read books. So they change again. And they say, yes, but who will tell you which books to read? So I, the teacher, will now tell you which books you should read and in what order. And how should you prepare for your examination? So each piece of technology changes the pedagogical style. So now jump to the current time. Your inexpensive, uh, commonly available technology is the tablet, the connected tablet. So what does it mean for teaching? And what should we teachers do to adapt to this new change? You're also familiar with this picture, children marching. I took this in India some time ago, and I asked the school principal, I said, who are they marching for? Um, George the fifth, George the sixth, or which George? <laughs> so he said, no, 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 they are all gone. I mean, so, so why are they marching? Uh, is there going to be a war? Are they all going to join the army? No, it's left over from the 19th century, but they're still marching. You must be familiar with this picture as well. In my time, it used to be called a tired and sleepy child. Now, that's, that's not what it's called. Now it's called ADHD. And she must be medicated for it. Okay? Nobody ever asks the teacher, what did you do to make her fall asleep? Okay, that's not allowed. You have to drug her until she wakes up. It's also, um, there's also another problem, which is quite an interesting one, which is that it's difficult to get teachers to go to remote places. I did uh, an experiment uh, in India a few years ago, about six or seven years ago, where I uh, took a route out of New Delhi 
which avoids all the built up places and my colleague two of my colleagues drove down that path uh, road in, deeper and deeper into rural india and every time they found a primary school they would stop and they would give a test for english math and science and then they brought the results back to delhi we totaled up the marks english plus math plus science and plotted that total against distance from delhi and we got this graph now that's a pretty interesting graph isn't it why does it go downwards why do the schools perform worse and worse the further away you go from the big city i tried to find an answer to this question and found one quite quickly if you ask the teachers in each of the schools would you like to work somewhere else then near delhi they say no it's fine we get a nice salary we have all the good facilities and you know good entertainment good healthcare good uh, schooling for our children everything is fine we don't want to go anywhere else you go about 100 kilometers away and the teachers say well you know i mean delhi is close but still it's quite a you know it takes 2 hours to get there so yeah maybe i might get a little closer to delhi you go 200 kilometers away and the teacher says anywhere but here okay so so what does the far away teacher do she tries to migrate and who succeeds the good ones so the good ones go away to delhi leaving the poorer ones behind the result this graph when i went to england in 2006 i thought that well i won't see this problem in england because that's developed economy the rural and the urban there's not that much different in fact some people like to live in uh, rural england so i looked at the gcse results in england northeastern england and i found that they have the same problem in the sense that there are good schools good results and there are bad results so what explains that in the case of england i tried looking for parameters obviously geography was not the reason there was a different reason in england if you plot the gcse results against a rather interesting parameter i'll explain what it is to you in england we have something called council housing council housing is a uh, free or subsidized housing provided by the government for poor people for people with some kind of you know problem or disability jobless uh, you know alcoholism that sort of thing so they get these houses some areas have lots of these houses and some areas have very few so there is a parameter called density of council housing now if you correlate the density of council housing against the gcse results you get the same curve as i got in india so then i thought well so here the relationship was not with geography but it was with economics so then i figured for myself that different countries have different definitions of what is remote in india remote meant geographically remote quite possibly in malaysia it will mean similarly but in england it was socio economic remoteness in the americas there are different kinds of remoteness there are regional remotenesses there are um, uh, cultural remoteness there are religious remote places there are ethnically remote places so there are all sorts of reasons because of which a good teacher doesn't want to go to a particular kind of area and there's not much you can do about it because teachers are human beings they want a good standard of living so they choose In India the government tried to solve this problem with teacher training. They said we'll do teacher training in the, so that the remote place teachers they'll become better and uh, things will be better. So so they went and started doing teacher training in remote areas. So now what do you think would happen if you went to a remote area and trained the teacher until she becomes really good? The first thing she does is she migrates to Delhi. So it doesn't solve the problem. What could solve the problem? Well, I published these results, and I uh, got uh, reactions from various countries, and it kind of corroborated what I was thinking. That every country said, "Yes, we have a problem. Our problem is in this particular area," and so on. Now, 
Now, I thought that there is one, uh, one saving grace that might apply, which is that computers don't care where they are. Whether they're in a remote place or whether they're in, the, in a city, they work the same way. So could technology give us a method by which we can equalize um, uh, th this disparity between remote and urban? Um, so I'm back in uh, a long time ago, um, I did an experiment which showed that groups of children can uh, teach themselves to use the internet by themselves. How did we find this is a, quite an interesting story. It's an experiment I did in 1999 called the hole in the wall, where uh, it was a very simple experiment. All I did was that I, I went to a slum in New Delhi, which uh, did not have a school at that time. And uh, there was a, a wall sort of separating the slum from a, a more posh part of the city. So in that wall, I made a hole, and I pushed a computer through that hole. It was about three feet off the ground, and it was connected to the internet. The children didn't know any English, and in those days, 1999, they didn't even know what a computer was, and they never heard of the internet. So they naturally got curious, and they sort of came running in, so what is this? And I purposely uh, left the place, and I didn't give them any help at all. I just wanted to see what they would do. And lots of people said, oh, it's very simple, it's a waste of time and money because they're going to break the computer and steal it and, and all sorts of things. But uh, that's not what happened. What happened was that eight hours later, we found the children browsing and teaching each other how to browse. So in 1999, that was a great surprise. That who, How did they figure all this out by themselves? And um, I didn't quite know. Some people said, oh, it's very simple. Uh, you know, somebody must have been passing by, one of the, one of the richer children who know something about computers, and uh, they saw these children trying to figure out the computer, so they went and showed them how to use the mouse. I thought this is possible, so I repeated the experiment in several different places, and I found that uh, there was no difference. Even if I went to a place which had no one nearby who had any knowledge of computers, children would still start using the computer. Um, here's a brief glimpse of uh, those years. This is the first day at this experiment called the hole in the wall. On your right, you see this little boy. He is eight years old. And to his left is his student, who is six years old. And he is teaching her how to browse. This is in the uh, deserts of Rajasthan. <laughs> So everywhere we got almost identical results of children, you know, playing a game. It might seem very trivial to, in today's terms, but in that, at that time, it was like a miracle. That how is this possible? Where are they learning this from? How are they learning it? And I didn't really know any numbers, but we started to measure computer literacy on a computing literacy scale at these at about 22 different locations, and we measured over a nine-month period by tracking random, a random group of children in each place. And we got a curve like this. Now, what that shows, uh, that graph, what it actually means is that, what it's trying to say is that groups of children, if unsupervised groups of children given access to a computer with the internet available, will, in a period of nine months, get the same level of competence on a computer as the average office secretary in the West. So you can imagine that it raised a lot of very fundamental questions about the nature of training. That what does this mean? You know? 
And I, of course, didn't have the answer and I was extremely curious to find out wh what was happening, what was the mechanism by which uh, this kind of learning can happen. We published the results and there was a great deal of hue and cry all over the place. Uh, but, but then I said, look, what can I do? I mean, this is what the numbers are saying. And this is what's been happening all in all of these places. I repeated then the experiments in Cambodia. I repeated them in South Africa. And everywhere we got the same graph, straight up like that. Then I decided to figure out that, OK, so they've learned how to use a computer. Uh, what happens after that then? In a remote area, you know, what do they do? And again, the expectation of the adults were that, well, they'll just spend all their time playing games, which they do in, indeed play a lot of games. But I discovered that they don't only play games. After a while, they get tired of playing games, and they start looking at other things on the computer. For example, they'll open up Word, and they'll start writing some meaningless thing into it. Or they will open Paint, and they start making paintings. That's very um, popular pastime. And then in one of the villages, a child said to me, you know this painting program, I really love this program, but the thing is that it just goes away. I mean, after I, I stop playing it, then somebody else comes and my painting's gone. So can't I do something about that? So in my approach, uh, what I do is I, I just say, I don't know. So I told her, I don't know, I have no idea. So she said, really, but it's terrible. I said, yes, it's terrible, but I can't help you. Why did I do that? Because if you want to build a sustainable model of anything, you can't expect that I will be there in each one of those computers telling them what to do. So, so I said, I don't know. Just about four days later, when I went back to the same place, then this child says to me, oh, we've solved the problem. I said, what did you do? So she shows me with the mouse. She said, you see this word, uh, you see this picture here? And it was the picture of a floppy disk. You see this picture here? If you click on that, then the painting goes inside the computer. So I said, really? Into what? So she said, really, into box, into a box inside the computer. And then when you open it again, and then she opened, and she clicked on open recent, and went and clicked and said, see, there's my picture. It comes out of the box if you do it that way. So I said, what are all these things? So she said, they're in English. I don't know what they are. So, uh, so now, would you call that reading, or would you call it something else? I don't know. But she knew how to save and how to load. So I said, well, so they're not only playing games. They're doing some very fundamental stuff on this. They're learning a whole lot of concepts, which they're actually reinventing for themselves. And uh, according to education theory, that's the best way to learn anyway. Then what happens? So I left the computer still there, a year passed. And then I found that they had discovered a search engine. I think it was Alta Vista or something in those days. Anyway, they had found a search engine. And they were typing all sorts of things into it in poor quality English. The good thing about the internet is that the internet corrects you and says, did you mean this? So they would do that. And the local school teachers, they started to say, you know, something has happened to the children. So I said, what? I said, their English has become perfect. <laughs> and the quality of their homework is superb. They're sort of referring to, you know, journals and things like that. So, so I thought to myself, oh my God, what have I done? <laughs> you know, they're just copying things off the, off the internet. Um, so, so that's not learning. Or is it learning? I would get the answer to my question only years later from Gateshead in England. So at that point in time, what I discovered was that if you, if you give the children a challenge on a computer, they could you know, do all sorts of things. They could uh, uh, you know, improve their uh, pronunciation, for example, uh, if, you, if it's a multimedia computer. They could improve their math. And I was you know, all along publishing uh, these results.
So uh, by the end of about four or five years of these, exper these experiments, I came to a conclusion that children could do a, a whole, learn a whole lot of things by themselves. Um, I still didn't know how they, would do, how they were doing this, but I knew that they could do it. And there were, you know, paper after paper where, uh, they had, uh, where I had measured that they were able to do something that they earlier could not do, and they had no external input. Back in England, it started off a debate, and people said that maybe you're, you know, overstating the case. Yes, it's very impressive what they can do, but if you say they can learn anything by themselves, that's not true. That can't be true. So I decided to test it with an experiment. So I designed an experiment which was uh, designed to fail. The, the research question was, um, uh, can Tamil-speaking children in a South Indian village learn the technology of DNA replication in English on a street side computer on their own? And I thought to myself, <laughs> this is not much of a research question. Obviously, the answer is no. Um, so I, I, I went and I found myself a village in South India called Kali Kuppam. And uh, it had, uh, uh, the group I took was about 12 year olds, uh, Tamil speaking. Um, they had a smattering of English which they learnt in school. So when I went there and loaded some material on genetics, basically, you know, DNA replication, 10, 12 years ahead of their time, obviously, because, you know, they're 12. They would learn that when they're 17, 18 years old. And I loaded all that material into the computer. So the children came running. They had a, a hole-in-the-wall computer, by the way. So the children came running there and said, what is it? Have you put in a new game? So I said, no, it's not a game, uh, but it's something very interesting, and it's in, uh, but I, I'm afraid it's in English. So the children immediately opened those files. They looked at the thing and they said, well, how can we understand this? This is terrible. It's got huge English words and it's got diagrams and chemistry and we can't understand this at all. How will we understand this? So I used my pedagogical method and I said, I have no idea how you understand it. So, <laughs> so you do whatever you like. <laughs> and I went away. So I came back after two months, um, after giving them a pretest, in which, as you might expect, they got a zero. I came back after two months and the children came in and said, we haven't understood anything. So I said, well, I mean, I didn't expect that you would, but uh, when did you give up? So they said, no, we haven't given up. We look at it every day. So I said, why do you look at it every day? So, I mean, you don't understand anything. So then one little girl says to me, no, in much, you know, broken Tamil and English, she said, uh, apart from the fact that uh, um, improper replication of the DNA molecule causes genetic disease, we've understood nothing else. <laughs> so, 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 I said, so that was, uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Well, I, I, I know what you feel like. I felt exactly like that at that point in time. <laughs> I, was, I couldn't believe what she was saying, you know. So when I said, uh, so I, we pre-tested, uh, we post-tested them. Anyway, this is what uh, Kuppam looks like. Um, and the uh, pre- and post-test results were an educational impossibility. Zero to 30 percent in two months by themselves in a language that they don't know seven years ahead of their time. How could it possibly happen? But anyway, it's still 30%. And I can't go back to England with that score because in our good old Victorian system, 30% is a fail. So how do I get them another 20 marks? So where do, I can't get a teacher there. So what I did get was a, a, um, a local, you know, there was a local NGO there who had an accountant, uh, a young girl. And she was a great friend of the children. So I called that girl and I said, listen, can you teach them a little more biotechnology? So she said, absolutely not. <laughs> I, don't, I didn't have any science in school. I have no idea what they're doing under that tree all day long with these chemistry diagrams, and I cannot help you. So I said, well, uh, what you do is you use the method of the grandmother. So she says, what's that? So I said, you know, just go behind them and um, go behind them, and whenever they do, do anything, just admire them. Just say, wow, how did you do that? You know, what is that screen? What was before? What was after? When I was your age, I couldn't have done anything like that. I was so stupid. So she used, I mean, I, I'm sure many of you have, all of you have grandmothers, so you know those techniques. So, 
So uh, just admire them and, and she did that for two more months. The scores jumped to 50%. So now I said, well, whatever is that mysterious mechanism that is producing this learning, it can be accelerated with admiration. Not subject, but admiration. So can that combination give us a method, a new way? So I came back to England and I started working with schools in England. So all this is published stuff. Anyway, I'll just go back a step. Um, so back in England, what I did was I used to go to the English schools. Now, uh, the teachers had by then all heard of these experiments. So they were very keen that, you know, come to our school and you know, tell us about it. So I said, no, it's not a question of telling you about it. It's a question of what do we do about it? So why don't we do the hole in the wall? So now obviously you cannot build a hole in the wall in England because of the miserable weather. You know, you'll get frozen children. So, 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 so what I did was I turned the hole in the wall upside down. What I would do is I would go into a classroom. If there are 25 children, I would give them five computers. Why? Because in the hole in the wall, I would see that uh, when things had settled down, there would be usually four or five children around each computer. So you give them five computers. If there are 25 children, you get groups of five. Or maybe groups of four is a little better. Um, and then you ask them to find out something. You ask them a question. But that question has to be very, very carefully engineered by you. If you give them a silly question, they're not going to get turned on at all. So it has to be a really interesting question. What's the example of a good, interesting question? Well, um, I just recently did one, uh, which was to say, uh, why do we have nails? Why do they grow? And why do we cut them off when they become too long? Okay. Now, you, uh, w w under what subject would you classify that question? Well, I'll tell you where it would classify. It would actually classify under social anthropology. It will take them all over the place when they try to answer a question like that. Children love that. Nine-year-olds, ten-year-olds, they'll go from, you know, hop across from subject to subject, subject to subject, which is what we don't do in schools. In schools, all the subjects are boxed. And then we have conferences like this to decide how do you get out of the box. <laughs> so, so it's, a very, it's, a, it's a very simple solution, you know. How do you get out of the box? <laughs> well, break the box, that's all. So anyway, um, if you... Uh, well, th th then I started... At, now, what I'll show you are two videos of two schools, one in New Delhi, one in Hong Kong. And both of them are dealing with a big question. The school in Delhi is dealing with the question of how does the brain work? Okay, and these are again about nine, ten year olds. Um, the, um, uh, um, and the school in Hong Kong is working on an even more crazy question. The question is can trees think? Okay, so if you can just uh, play that video, please. So among many other things, I mean, they, they jumped way ahead. So uh, then if I show you the next one, if you play that one, please. So I, I'll just jump that, but anyway, the point is that uh, they're dealing with subjects which are way outside of anything that they would do in school. They're not scared, they're coming up to the top of the class and they're reading out and, 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 and uh, saying things which are miles ahead of whatever it is you would have taught them. But you did it by posing the question. So, so you know, if you come back to the, uh, our initial discussion, our teachers obsolete, they're not. But the time has come when, like when printing was invented, when paper was invented, the time has come where we have to change again, one more time. So what's that change? Well, this time, you don't deliver anything because all the stuff is up there. You just ask. So 
We know that this method of leaving behind a, a big question will produce about 30% achievement. Remember Kuppam. And to get the balance 20, you need a grandmother. So back in Britain, I put out a, a call in the, through the British newspaper saying, if you are a British grandmother, if you have broadband and a web camera, then can you give me one hour of your time per week for free? In two weeks, I got 200. So I know more British grandmothers than anyone in this room. Okay. So, <laughs> they, they are called the granny cloud. Okay. What the granny cloud does is that you, I, can, I can beam them into a school and they go into the school and they just play the granny role. They just say, wow, fantastic, what are you doing today? And so on and so forth. Um, a combination of this few computers and lots of children, which we call a self-organized learning environment, or S-O-L-E. So a combination of a soul and the granny cloud seems to be an alternative situation at last to that one teacher and 30 children in a room of six meters by six meters. So here's what a granny cloud session kind of looks like. The, uh, the teacher and the students are separated by about 5,000 miles in this case. Uh, you can watch just a little bit of it. Um, if you can play that uh, video, please. So uh, the, uh, I've been doing this now since 2009 and the first thing you'll notice if you ever try this is that the children's English immediately starts to change. Obviously it has to, if every week they're speaking, they, you know children copy accents. So they start copying the accents, the mannerisms and so on. And the best part of it is it's all for free, you know. I mean there's the retired workforce and you heard this morning from His Excellency that, uh, 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 you know, uh, the number of people who are 65 and above uh, and, and how do you support them? Well, here's a way to bring those 65-year-olds with the six-year-olds to produce a, a, an incredible magnifying effect on education, on culture, on values, anything that you want to try. Well, so I've published all of that again, and this time, years and years later, finally the teacher said, yeah, you might have got something nice there. So I said, well, thank God, thank you. But now, a couple of things which we don't know. You know, at the heart of this whole method is the fact that you have to be able to read. If you can't read, then none of this will work. So I have a big question. Can children learn to read by themselves? And the answer at a superficial level is yes. But I, I don't have the full answer yet, so I can't tell you what the answer is. But I'll show you a hilarious section. I'm trying out an experiment in India of two little girls trying to understand the meaning and pronunciation of the word sheep, S-H-E-E-P. -E okay, here goes. If you can play that video, please. So I think it's quite clear they had got the meaning of the word. <laughs> so the question is how far they will go. I did a study in Uruguay which showed that exposure to computers for five years in that country. You know, Uruguay is a country where there is no child who doesn't have a laptop. So I studied what that had done and they were reading way above their counterparts in most other countries in the world. So this method, Seoul, Again, I don't know the full answer, but I suspect 
See this, uh, when, when children research on a, on a big question, now the internet doesn't know that they're children, so the internet will produce whatever they are asking for and they will produce adult quality material. And the children then attempt to read that. And that attempt seems to be increasing their reading comprehension absolutely dramatically. I'm testing for that now to see, you know, what are the numbers. So we know that children can do lots of, you know, fantastic things by themselves. Um, can they learn how to search on the internet by themselves? Because the second thing that you need in a soul is the ability to search. So I'm testing for that as well. And of all these fantastic things that they do, they're also doing this at younger and younger ages. So, you know, two and a half year olds is, is, the, is my lower limit so far, is that two and a half year olds can handle a tablet phone or an iPad and do all sorts of things with it. I mean, those of you who have children, I'm, I'm sure you, you've seen them, what they do if you ever hand your tablet over to them. So I have a grand niece who, uh, in America, who uh, was once showing off to me uh, with her mother's iPad when the mother was not around. So she said, I can download an app. So, so I said, you know, don't do that. You know, do you know it's going to cost your mother money? So she said, no. I'll download a free one. So, so I said, you know, she can't read or write. So, so I said, well, how will you download? How do you know which is, one is free? So she says, I'll show you. She so goes to one of the applications, so op one of the download things, uh, Play Stores, opens the application, points to the box there for the payment, and says, if there are no squiggly things inside, then it's free. <laughs> okay. So now, what do you call that? Is that reading, or is it something that we haven't seen before? If it is something that we haven't seen before, then we have to bring it into education somehow. We have to figure it out. Okay? And don't say that you know, the government has to figure it out. The government can't figure out everything. <laughs> the teachers have to figure it out and tell the government. So curriculum needs to include the internet, whether it is higher education, lower education, primary education. The internet has to figure inside the curriculum somehow. Uh, I think uh, someone has to figure that out. How, how, how do you go about building such a curriculum? Just to give you an example, um, this is part of the British national curriculum. And what it says is that uh, pupils, in one part of it, it says pupils should, uh, uh, what's that? Pupils should be taught to recognize that the past is represented and interpreted in different ways and to give reasons for this. Now imagine you as a teacher, you walk into your classroom where these poor children are waiting for whatever is to come and you tell them, today I'm going to teach you that the past is represented and interpreted in different ways and to give reasons for all this. I mean, obviously they're going to all fall asleep. So instead of that, what I would do is I would change it into a question. In a museum in an Indian city of Mathura, there is a statue of the great emperor Kanishka. Who was he and why is his head missing? Okay, children love missing heads. <laughs> so, I mean, when I try this, they laugh exactly like you're laughing. And then they get onto it. But the point is that the answer to this question is that history can be interpreted differently by different people. And they'll get to it in 30 minutes flat, I can guarantee you. Okay, so why would you teach in that old way? Why did they teach in that old way? But they didn't have the internet, but now you do. We're all familiar with this, and many of us don't like it. Because we say, you know, they're getting isolated from each other, they're only staring at their mobile phones all the time, they don't talk to anybody, etc., etc. We assume that they're doing something terrible on their mobile phones. Okay? We never cross-check. I did. I did something dreadful in Britain, Britain, very rude. I use a bus quite often. So in the bus, I would go and sit behind kids with their mobile phones and I would peer over their shoulder to see what they were doing. You know? All in the cause of science. So <laughs> what I found was that they do all kinds of things. Well, they, they play games occasionally. They chat quite a bit. And they search a lot. Each of the searches is actually, in our words, a learning experience. 
So these kids, they're continuously learning of the assistive technology that they have. There is no need to berate them. It's the, it's, there is only need that when they're really young to sort of uh, guide them a little bit in using the device properly. Pedagogy has to include the internet. That's what we've been talking about all this last 40 minutes. Um, in what way? Well, this is how we solve problems today. This is how we solve problems in offices. Doesn't that remind you of the hole in the wall? It's almost identical, that picture, to some of my old pictures from 14 years ago. So that's how, but why don't we teach this way of problem solving in school? This is the way we solve problems in office. So why don't we? Can we use that method in school? Well, I went to a school in England recently and did a soul. In a sub I told them that I'll do it in a subject that I don't know anything about. And it turned out to be art. And the, what the art teacher said was, I was going to teach them Cezanne's use of light and shade in his still life watercolors. So I told the children, look, this is what you were supposed to be taught. Now I can't even spell Cezanne, and I have no idea what he's talking about. So can you help me with this? So the kids said, no, we don't know anything either. So then I said, well, there you go. We'll take your four computers, and they were, these are 12 year olds. Well, uh, here's a uh, look at what happened next. Can you just play that video, please? <laughs> Full name was Paul Cezanne. Cezanne was his second name and Paul was his first name. Uh, he was French. He was born in 1839 and he died in 1906. In most of his paintings he made them three-dimensional. So that was achieved by the front being lighter than the back of the painting. So that's your three-dimensional. So uh, I, uh, I mean, you get the idea. But they've gotten everything, and they put it in terms which even the art teacher appreciated. That uh, little kid you saw, who said he used light and shade in his watercolors to make things 3D, which is you know the young people's language for describing what Cezanne did, which is exactly right. Anyhow, so we don't allow children to solve problems that way. What we do instead is that we expect them to solve problems this way. That's the examination hall. So examinations need to include the internet. And that is what I'm going to leave you with as a proposition. What will happen if in the end of school examination you allowed the use of an internet connected tablet? If you think about it, it will change the entire system. Well, first of all, you as a teacher, you're never going to ask your children to remember anything. Because, you know, I mean, they'll find it in two seconds anyway. Uh, what are you going to tell them to do? You're going to tell them, be careful about searching for the right thing quickly, figuring out which one is the right piece of information, and then summarizing it. A totally different pedagogy. So once again, when the technology changes, the teacher will change. Here's an example from a GCSE question. According to Darwin's theory, etc., uh, how do species evolve? By artificial selection, natural selection, unnatural selection. It's the most stupid question I've ever seen. Okay? You could change that question to this. Why do we have five fingers or toes on each of our limbs? Why not any other number? Use the internet and mutual discussion to develop a paragraph on this. Don't you think that's a better question than the previous one? It's a, it's a question that will roll pedagogy, curriculum, and subject knowledge all together. Because in the process of answering that question, you'll learn one hell of a lot about evolution. So why should we not change examinations to reflect this? Success, unfortunately, is still defined as being able to spell correctly using a fountain pen. Uh, that has to change, I think. 
I know this is going to hurt. It hurts me because I'm from that old generation. But what good is handwriting for a generation that's never going to write by hand? Is it important to spell when your assistive technology continuously corrects it? The same thing with grammar. Why do you need to know multiplication tables? I mean, I'm sure all of you have been taught 17 times tables and been berated if you couldn't do it right. But do you need 17 times tables? Is it a life skill? We have to examine what else is going out of the window and has to go fast. You, if you answered an examination question paper in Shakespeare's English, you will fail. If you answer it in texting language, you've had it. But if you answer it in 1930s English, you are a good girl. Okay? Who's decided the 1930s has to be the year when English was perfect? <laughs> and that's the English that we have to learn. We must recognize that we are, we are uh, living with a leftover education system from the age of empires. You know, the, the, the Prussian Empire, uh, the, the French Empire, um, uh, the Spanish Empire, and finally the British Empire. Uh, in order to run their empires, what did they need? They needed clerks, because there were no computers, there were no telephones. What did the clerk need? Reading, writing, and arithmetic. Those became the pillars. So they built a system that they needed, and it worked perfectly well for 200 years. It ran the whole show. But we don't need it now. This is what the office used to look like back then, 1920, 1910. This is what it used to look like, a floor supervisor and clerks. Okay? Now see that a couple of times. Do you see who you're producing these people for? You're producing them for, em for uh, uh, employers who are dead. So the obsolescence of ideas, methods, knowledge needs to be factored into, into our learning methods, into our institutional models, into our pedagogic models. And uh, I'm trying to do that. Um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to see what the role of the teacher is. If it's the grandma role, then the teacher has to be a friend, not a guide, not, not a guru, uh, just a friend. And if a teacher is a friend, then you could have schooling forever. I'm trying to build some facilities in very remote areas of India where there are no schools. And I got some money recently for, for a prize from TED. So I'm using that money to build seven facilities, five in India and two in the United Kingdom, where in the, over the next three years I'll look at reading comprehension, searching skills, and how far children can go by themselves. Ted gave it a pretty romantic name. They're called Schools in the Cloud. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Sugata Mitra, Professor of Educational Technology. What an eye opener! But I still believe in the 1930s empire. And that is still the kind of uh, dedication and uh, discipline that I instill in my son. But most probably, I have to open my mind <laughs> um, to yeah. the realities of today. Yes, I think so. In fact, if you notice, the first row and the two of us, we are all dressed identically. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> we've stuck, we've, we've remained <laughs> in, the in, the, in, the in the 1930s. <laughs> That's right. And now, the new generation doesn't anymore wear a tie. No, huh? thank, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> so, indeed, but we can have synergies, right, uh, Professor? Synergies between the 1930s and educational technology of today. There could be synergies. Or do we have to choose one over the other? I think we should forget about anything before 2000. <laughs> I have to live for today. I think I still, I still live in the dinosaur age. <laughs> you know, when my son doesn't write, he doesn't spell, he doesn't read properly, I scold him. But oh. now it's different. I will tell him to learn and read more on the internet. 
Yes, you should do that. I should do that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so do we have any questions from the floor? Any uh, reactions, violent reactions, positive reactions? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Please state your name and where you're from. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Prof. Sugata, for the very uh, inspiring lectures. But I just want to ask, uh, because I'm, my name is Mira. I'm currently working in International Islamic University, but I'm also founding uh, Inter Indonesian Cyber Parenting Club. And uh, I have been encountering a couple of mothers who are stressed, I can put it that way, because they have been uh, facing a number of challenges when they introduce technology to the kids. Not really introduce, I think the kids explore by themselves. And recently there's one mother which is complained that uh, once the school introduced internet, the student, uh, the, the, her son exploring to the new world, which is we don't want to, him to expose at the very young age, which is pornography. So, um, because you have exposed with positive side of the technology, so how can we anticipate this negative side of the technology? Thank you. Filtering the bad on the internet. Actually, I have, I, I learned a very uh, simple method for that. I used to get a, a very worried when I was doing those village experiments that uh, what would happen, until I discovered that if the screens are large and public and publicly visible, if the internet is available on a 48-inch monitor six feet away from the principal's office, <laughs> you, you won't have a problem. <laughs> Guaranteed. That is in school, Professor, but what about at home? No, so quite seriously, so even to parents, what I would say is, if you lock your child up in his bedroom with a tiny screen and you know, 3G access, then you're asking for trouble and you'll get it. Mm. The internet should have the same position in the home as the home TV does, which is in the living room, publicly visible, then mm. all, everything takes care of itself. So um, I think we, in our, in our desire to protect our own privacy and to get our own free time, we send the children upstairs. That's wrong. And we'll have to pay for it if we do that. <laughs> so there should be access where everyone can s see what yeah. their child is doing. Absolutely. And uh, the trade-off with the child should be, because the child is going to say, no, I, I need a little phone and things like that. The trade-off is that, look, I'll get, you, I'll get you an Xbox, I'll get you a 48-inch screen, but nothing doing. You can't have that little one. Similarly, if you have to have a tablet, most children would like a tablet, we'll buy them a big one, not a small one. All right. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Azim. Okay. I would like to know how we can change the mindset of the parents because these days parents are just worried about the scores, their kids' scores, instead of what they are learning. So yeah. they just want to make uh, their kids more competitive and get uh, higher marks than their neighbor, for example. But they are not worried about what they are learning, what kind of knowledge they are gaining. So how do we change that mindset of the parents? It's a very uh, extremely important question. You've hit the problem uh, spot on. Um, the only way to do it is, well, th there are several ways to do it, but one of the most important or easy ways to do it is to impact the examination system. See, the parents are only interested in the examination system. The day they hear that the child is allowed to use the internet during his geography exam, that same parent will then go home and say, now you open the internet, okay? And every day open the internet and, <laughs> and figure out your geography. So, uh, so we need that impact. The other end of the impact is, where, is the areas where I work, is that there, are, uh, uh, there is in India, and I'm sure there will be in Malaysia also, the, the bottom of the heap, where they, don't ha where they don't actually know anything at all. So they, they have no expectations. They don't think that their children are going to do well. So to them, I say, leave it to me. And at least in India, I have these very remote communities where they say, whatever it is you're trying will be good for them. So the two ends of the question. All right. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Hi. Uh, my name is Anthony. I'm from California, but living in Malaysia. And something I notice here is it's really popular for parents to send their kids out until 10 o'clock at night. These kids are doing tuition. And everybody does it because everyone else is doing it. And they feel like they're not being responsible parents unless they're sending their kids off like uh, soldiers into the night. Yes. And the kids are coming home at 10 o'clock at night. And I'm, I'm not doing this with my own kid. But you're pressured because you see that everyone is doing this. So 
How much is too much? Yeah, well, private tuition in India is uh, is a huge, uh, you know, multi-million dollar industry. And the reason for that is because of a notion that almost all parents have that the children will do that the child will do better in the final examination if a private tutor is appointed uh, and not so good if they're not uh, so this is what causes that private tuition phenomenon to happen and once again it is caused uh, purely by the examination system so uh, I know it's not a very practical answer, but it is the only answer I can give is that we've all got to collectively somehow change the examination system. And if we do that, then all of these problems will actually go away. Um, also, there is another dan dangerous trend, which is that pub uh, private tuition was uh, not uh, existing at all in Europe, UK, or USA, simply because you can't afford it. If you get a good private tutor, I mean, it's, it's going to cost such a bomb that you cannot afford that. Because of the internet, private tuition agencies started off in South India. And they charge something like $10 an hour, and they provide a tutor over Skype. And I was reading the statistics of that business, and it's growing exponentially, particularly in the United States, and particularly with mathematics tuition because of this false notion that um, Indians will teach mathematics extremely well, and anyway, it's not much money. So, so private tuition, you know, so the parents' mind is quite rightly so guided by the end of school exam. And until we impact that, we, it will be really difficult to, uh, for us to change their minds. But in the 1930s, 1940s, we didn't really have any of these uh, private tutors. It is only over the past... Uh, uh, past decade that we've been hiring oh. private tutors, and I'm also guilty because my son has three tutors. There you go. Basically, <laughs> and it's only in primary three. So the thing it's, is, it's also because of the of the competitiveness. Yes. You want to have a higher grade than your classmate or, yes. or your friend or your relative. So the it's thing too is, much. Uh, yeah. I have to put an end to this. <laughs> yes. No, the thing <laughs> is that uh, you see, in the 1930s, the, the the world population was a lot lower. It was possible to have reasonably good schools wherever you needed them, and unfortunately. In the 1930s, there was a clear demarcation mm. between who should be educated and who should not. Mm. So, you know, the top brass got right. ed education. They didn't need any tutors. Yeah, well, uh, me, I'm sure you're a self professor. Yes. We never had a I private never, tutor. I never had a private, I never tutor. Had a private I, tutor. I would memorize everything perfectly, reproduce it in the exam, forget it instantly <laughs> after that. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe take the time to teach your children, right? Instead <laughs> yes. of getting a private tutor. Yes. We have uh, one final question from the floor. Yes, ma'am. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Shuan from Malaysia. I'd just like to ask, um, continue on, on um, the question before this. How does um, the traditional method of teaching compare to this new method? Like, are there any scientific research on the comparison of the effectiveness of this teaching method? Well, that's a, uh, it's a kind of a tricky question. I'll tell you why. Because when you say, how do I compare the results of this kind of teaching with traditional teaching, there is an assumption. The assumption is, how do I compare the results given that the examination remains a constant? So in the same exam, how will this kind of learning uh, learner perform versus the traditional learner? Well, the good traditional learner will learn better from the point of view of the question. But if you change the question to a, mm -hmm. if, if I changed it to that, how, why do we have five fingers? You know what will happen inside a real classroom is that those guys at the back, the C graders, they are the ones who are going to solve it, not the toppers. <laughs> so, so, uh, so, so I, I mean, I, I know I sound like a broken record. But it's the examination system. Examination okay. System. So, but on the other hand, if you look at that lesson like the one on Cezanne, for an art course where you don't have the traditional examination system, it produces a miracle immediately. So, is are we seeing educational institutions not reforming or not innovating on the examination system? It's because it may cost a lot more, or it is basically stuck in the past it is i think it is the latter it is, it is stuck in the past you know we need to have we need to have a statesman 
Hmm. I don't think a politician could do an this. An education czar. An education statesman huh. who will just make that one policy change, hmm. allow the tablet inside the exam hall, and then sit back. Everything will change. Very good. Final question. All right. I was... Uh, yeah, yes, one last yeah. question. One last. Because we've run out of time. We've gone over time. <laughs> yes. Okay. No, here, here, here. <laughs> the, the thing is, here, it's not so much a question, it's a statement. Um, I think uh, the children, uh, uh, they're born with every um, weapon when you talk about in, in being inquisitive, asking questions. Unfortunately, they lose all that the minute they go to school. We breed it out of them. Yeah? Now, I think we also seem to somehow or other misunderstand that the entire thing about education is for students. Yeah, we bring politics to it. Um, we, we bring everybody else into it. So the minute we learn ourselves, forget about the students for a minute. The minute we learn about ourselves, how to make that mind shift, how to, to change that state of mind, that the student is king, it will always continue to remain the way it is. Yes, it's absolutely. not going to make that change. Absolutely. And I, in fact, it illustrates my point. Uh, while you were speaking, I was just thinking to myself that if all I want are clerks to run an empire, do I want clerks who are curious and wishes to learn things all the time? That's the last thing I would want. So the first thing I'll do is weed out the curiosity and say, you do exactly what you're told. And on that note, we would like to thank Professor Sugata Mitra. Thank you very much for a very interesting and eye-opening uh, talk. Thank you very much, Mr. Mitra. Thank you very much for joining us at the World Innovation Forum, Kuala Lumpur 2013. And before we move on to the next session, we would like to Check. inform everyone about the third session quiz winner. And the winner is... Maybe please uh, pull up the names on our screens. Yes, we have... Maud Amirul Shafiq. All right, congratulations. And Ko Pei Hun, congratulations. Thank you very much.